Uh, good afternoon. Um, welcome to all the participants joining us um, today. My name's Stephanie Davison um, and I'm your moderator today for our uh, follow-on, what is a follow-on session for, from a session we did before Christmas. Um, this session is about um, ensuring compliance going forward. So for those of you who joined us for the first session, um, you may recall um, it was really about what we sh should we be doing now. So we talked about the wage theft legislation, what the unions are doing, how the police are becoming involved. We talked about the ATO and what it was doing um, and also some aspects of superannuation, really focused on what should you be doing now to, to get yourself to the starting position, if you like, of compliance. Um, this session is, is actually about, okay, assuming you've got to that now starting position where you're confident about your compliance, what do you need to do now going forward in terms of every day sort of routinely checking in on, on your, your compliance? Um, so, so my name is Stephanie Davison. Um, I'm a partner here at Clayton Oots in the mergers and acquisitions, capital markets um, and board advisory area, um, governance, risk and conflicts. Um, so what I'll do is I'll just hand over to my uh, panellists and they can quickly introduce themselves and then we might uh, kick into the to the session. Um, I do have, um, we do have one change to the program, uh, which is Amber Augustine, who joined us in the first session, uh, who was scheduled to come to this session, has actually lost her voice, um, which is a little tricky for a, for a webinar. Um, so kindly, David Lee um, has agreed to step in on very short notice. Thank you, David, um, to to help us out. But uh, I'll just hand over to the panelists, and they can just give you a little bit about their background. Thanks, Steph. My name is Christy Miller. I'm a partner here at Clayton Newts in the Workplace Relations, Employment and Safety team. I do a lot of work in the uh, remediation of underpayment space. I work closely with our tax and FTS colleagues, who you'll meet today, to to look at the best ways to resolve and uh, ensure compliance moving forward, including notifications to the Fair Work Ombudsman for underpayments and how to manage uh, those remediations to employees. Uh, David. Uh, th thanks, Christy. Uh, my name's David Lee. I'm a senior associate in the uh, tax team at Clayton Utes, and I work closely um, with Amber Augustine, my partner, and as well with um, Christy in Workplace and Deepak in in their teams, um, and, and we, we've been helping um, many employers um, address um, some of their uh, superannuation guarantee obligations and engaging with the ATO um, in those respects. Deepak? Thanks, David. Uh, my name is Deepak Millay. I'm one of the directors in our Forensic and Technology Services Group. Uh, I specialise in data analytics and have been working the last 13 years essentially helping clients identify and quantify issues. Um, I've done a lot of work in the internal and external audit space, looking at payroll audits, uh, identifying any issues as part of that process and um, naturally have transitioned into uh, working with uh, Christy and the workplace team and David in terms of identifying and quantifying size of potential employee entitlement issues as well. Uh, Steph, I'll pass it back to you. Thank you. Um, so just a few uh, probably more administrative matters before we kick off. So questions, um, feel free to ask them as we go if you have any. We have a live feed that comes through to us. So if you have any uh, particular queries you'd like to ask, just shoot them through and we will deal with them on the way through. Um, and uh, I think uh, the session's being videoed as well, so it will be available as well if you uh, want to share it with, with any other members of your team. Um, so as I said, the, um, the, the idea behind this session is we assume now that you've interrogated your wages and entitlements position um, and you've remediated where necessary, so you've got your clean starting point if you like. Um, I suppose the message is that it's not a set and forget um, review um, anymore. Um, so we really wanted to focus on what are these, what are the ongoing obligations to monitor and ensure continued compliance um, in the framework of what should senior managers and the boards be looking at and doing um, in order to ensure that they're complying with their their obligations. Um, so in order to set the scene, uh, I think 
when we're talking about sort of compliance and ensuring compliance, what what does that mean in an ongoing sense in this space? Um, Christy, can you? Sure. So from an employment or a workplace relations perspective, when we talk about ensuring compliance, we're not just looking at the figures or, or the payroll. What we need to take into account is a holistic viewpoint. I, I would love to say that the Fair Work Act or the employment legislation is one, one of those pieces of legislation that never changes, but we know that not to be true. There are huge changes uh, always. With any change of government, really, we have significant changes. And in fact, the, the Morrison government has proposed significant changes again to the industrial relations legislation through their omnibus bill, which is currently before Parliament, and I'll talk about that a little bit more. But we need to, when we talk about that clean slate, that Steph mentioned, and once we have that starting point, it will never stay that way if we don't ensure that we are regularly keeping up to date with changes in the legislation and the law and changes to our industrial instruments. Um, they are slated for review every four years, but they're not. that's not the only time where they can be amended. And we saw very recently uh, in November of last year significant updates and clarifications being made to modern awards and in March when they introduced changes to annualised salary regimes. If your business is taking advantage of those types of annualised salary regimes or uh, individual flexible workplace agreements, um, we need to make sure in terms from a compliance setting that our paperwork is in place, that we meet those strict record keeping requirements, that we are recording particularly in relation to annualised salaries now, starting times, finishing times, unpaid breaks taken. We have employee signatures and acknowledgements where those are required by the regulations or the types of instruments that we are entering into. Because a failure to ensure compliance with those aspects of the legislation will mean that the annualised salary that we've entered into is not going to be sufficient. It means we won't be able to rely upon that all-up salary arrangement that we'll need to then, if investigated by the Fair Work Ombudsman, be looking at people's wages as compared to the award. And it may be that we're not paying the uh, overtime or um, the penalty rates in accordance with the award because of the annualised salary arrangement. So making sure we get compliance right from all those that paper perspective as well will ensure that we are well placed to ensure compliance moving forward. Um, I think. As well, businesses need to be aware that stakes are higher after an identified shortfall. So if there is a concern in relation to compliance that has been identified and rectified, um, particularly if the Fair Work Ombudsman has been involved in that, they will take a more keen interest in compliance across all aspects moving forward for business. So that's something to be alive to and may impact upon timeframes for businesses when they're considering how often they want to do uh, compliance reviews and checks. Okay, so um, you, if you've done your review, you've generally mined a fair bit of information and data from that review. Um, so I, I suppose, Deepak, a question for you, that work that, that's been done to identify and quantify the current position, um, can you use some of that or can you leverage off that work to look at your ongoing compliance and how do you best do that? Yep, no, that's a good question, Steph. Um, before I answer that, I might just do a bit of a refresher as well for those that weren't involved in the, the last presentation. Uh, but what we covered last time from a data analytics perspective is when you are looking at um, uh, historical uh, a review, you generally are taking your industrial instrument, you're doing um, some legal interpretation, and then you're creating a rule set to independently uh, check that the employment uh, entitlement calculations are actually correct. What you've actually developed during that process is this independent rule set. And the advantage of that is that you can actually take that going forward. So what you can actually do is with that rule set, you can then continuously uh, do audits, whether they be uh, per pay run, whether you do them quarterly, or whether you do them yearly. It's essentially just applying the same data um, that you have in the historical review um, uh, to the, the model. And we've seen a lot of clients that have actually um, taken those uh, models that they've developed as part of the historical review and used them ongoing, whether they be uh, on, on a uh, pay role, uh, on a pay period basis. So we have a couple of clients that will actually run 
uh, the data through the model before they run their actual payroll to identify any issues and they can fix it before actually doing the pay run. Other clients have elected to do a yearly review. So they're using those same models and they revisit it every year just to make sure that the payments that they've done in the prior years, in the prior year is actually accurate. Um, a good example that Christy just mentioned is those annualized salaries as well. Um, those ones we've actually seen clients where they do it per pay run. They're actually applying those rule sets and identifying per pay run if uh, any particular employee is going over that threshold for that particular pay run. Even though it's an annualized salary calculation, um, they want to make sure that they are they are paying their employees uh, per pay run in accordance with um, those entitlements as well. Uh, one of the advantages of also utilizing those rule set. Um, is the ability to also automate that process. Um, a lot of the data that you're using for those uh, for that testing is coming directly from the payroll or timesheet systems. Generally, you've created those rule sets based on the standard um, data reporting available through those systems or the way the data is actually stored in those databases. So being able to actually automate, so connect those payroll systems directly into those models, um, it makes it an automatic process. You're not actually spending uh, a lot of effort every time you're running the audit, and it allows you to do that continuous control monitoring uh, every pay run. Um, and the the ongoing component of it as well generally is minimal work once you have got it automated. There will obviously be changes to legislation, to enterprise agreements uh, that will require you to go and revisit those rules that you've created. Uh, but once you've actually updated those rules, um, the automation aspect of it will actually make it uh, a lot easier to, to deal with ongoing compliance. So, Deepak, just to follow on, in terms of you talked briefly there about updating, you talked about this independent rule set and this model that you create. So, obviously, awards might change, legislation might change. Presumably, you have to update that rule set. And what's the process for that and how long does that take and how onerous, you know, how you know what how difficult is that i suppose yeah it's really going to come down to the tools and technology that you use to actually develop those rule sets um, most times with a lot of the analytics tools available these days rule sets are easy to change they're they're um essentially just a bit of code saying that if you get this data multiplied by a certain amount to to, to get that uh, the intricacies come when you have rules that might clash with other rules and that's where the complexity usually comes in um, uh, and identifying those complexities is where you're going to be probably spending a lot of the effort. The technical development of those rules aren't uh, too hard. It's the interpretation of what those rules actually mean that uh, you need a bit of upfront thinking to, to make sure that when you apply those rules, um, they're, they're easy to do. But usually the, the individuals that have created those original tool sets, uh, original rules, will be able to modify them uh, quite easily and quickly. And I'll talk a bit later as well about some of the tools that are available, but there are a lot of tools coming into the market that are allowing end users, so people that don't actually know how to code, to be able to generate these rules. So those kind of tools can easily be used within payroll teams to, to help with that. Okay, all right, thanks for that, Deepak. Um, so I suppose then moving on to um, Deepak's touched on some of that, you know, some people are running them every pay run, some people are doing them annually. I suppose from a compliance, you know, governance sort of point of view, Christy, how, and perhaps um, David, you might speak to this as well, how often should you really be running them? I mean, clearly you probably don't need to run them every pay run. So if you're looking at setting up a system that fit for purpose and what works for you, um, what would you say is, is a reasonable sort of com compliance? Assuming we're starting, uh, and I'll jump in first, David, and then I'll hand over to David. Um, assuming we're starting from a position of known compliance, yeah. so we've done those initial checks, we've reviewed our payroll, we've done that forensic dive into our material to make sure that there are no concerns there and we've satisfied ourselves with that position. I would say at a minimum we want to be reviewing our compliance as against awards, enterprise agreements and legislation at least once every 12 months. And you'd so want even to, if nothing's changed, you'd still be I'd doing still it? I still want to do it. I still want right. to do it once every 12 months. Um, and mainly because there are requirements in a number of awards, mm -hmm. particularly around annualised salary arrangements, that require a reconciliation every 12 months. Uh, it may be also built into your enterprise agreements, particularly reconciliations I'm thinking around time off um, or toil, uh, time off in lieu of overtime. So to make sure that if we are banking toil, that we are treating it appropriately in accordance with our EAs and that we are meeting the requirements of awards. In 
to reconciliation score, as I say, annualised salaries. So at a minimum, I'd want to do that every 12 months. Um, and certainly, minimum rates of pay will change in awards every 12 months right. as well, uh, and presumably in your enterprise agreements. So just making sure, and that sounds like an easy thing to um, to pick up and make sure you don't miss, but it, you know, I'm sure DPAP will tell us minimum pay rate increases are things that are often missed. So minimum 12 months uh, is my starting point, but if we've had a material change in legislation, awards, enterprise agreements, I'd want to be moving that forward to make sure that we are addressing compliance issues as and when they could potentially arise. Okay. And do these minimum um, wage sort of rates, do they change at the same time every year? So does that, I'm just backing up against a board calendar and what that might look like, yeah. for example. Normally they do. So, so normally they change at the same time every year around June, around April, May, the Fair Work Commission will release its statement as to what the uh, minimum wage increases will be and they'll take effect in, in June. Uh, not so for the COVID years. They staggered the wage increases across uh, four different periods subject to the type of award that you were, you were responding to. Uh, and I'm not sure what that may continue or that may not continue for the following year based on, I think, economic recovery and how the, the Fair Work Commission sees that. So. Normally it is every year, but I think we've got to get out of uh, this pandemic phase before we can be guaranteed that wage rates in awards will only go up or change uh, each year. Yeah, okay. Okay. David, did you have anything to add to that? Um, uh, uh, mm -hmm. I'd agree as well. Um, obviously, um, the compliance audit or audits um, may, the timing may vary um, depending on the circumstances of um, well, yeah, but um, I'd agree a good starting point definitely is firstly, they should be done at least annually. And the program should be broad enough to likely pick up risks among different cohorts of different categories of, of employees. Um, and, and to further echo from Christy, yeah, secondly, they, they should be done when there's any potential material change relating to the business. And as Christy mentioned, um, changes to the um, EAs and workforce policies but also um, where there's, if there's any changes relating to the superannuation guarantee, ideally in advance of the law change, um, and maybe even um, upon acquisition of new businesses of new business as well. Um, you, you probably there's probably already an audit system set up in the business. I expect the tax audits and, and internal audit if you're larger as well. So is can you actually, is it practical to run these sort of audits with that sort of general audit system that you've got set up in the business, um, particularly from a tax perspective, David? Presumably there's tax reviews that are done regularly. Yeah, certainly. Um, um, that, that would be standard and um, it, it's good practice to, to, to do that regularly as well, incorporate that. Okay. Um, so I suppose from, on the ground, Christy, what are the questions you're getting about compliance? So what are, there must be themes that are coming out around people are saying, well, what about this? Or, you know, should I be looking at that? So um, I suppose what are you seeing as the points that people are raising? And also, do you think with this omnibus legislation that you mm -hmm. talked about, is that going, what do you anticipate might be the questions that will come out of that? Well, I think compliance just generally is um, a hot topic for many employers uh, at the moment, and I, and I don't think that's going to go away. I think compliance and potential underpayment is just part of the standard vocabulary now that everyone looks at and uses. In terms of themes that we're seeing, um, it's really those the, the tricky interactions that we're finding in awards or enterprise agreements for, employee, for employers that we're acting for, the potential um, interplay, and as Deepak mentioned, of some particular clauses in enterprise agreements and awards where there are multiple interpretations and the business have adopted one particular interpretation, but the legal advice might be that another interpretation is preferred. Um, that is a real cause for concern for many businesses at the moment. So making sure that, as Deepak pointed out, getting those rules right at the very beginning um, and uh, addressing compliance, I think, from a, from a proactive standpoint with, with if we know and we've addressed the historical non-compliance issues, moving forward, making sure that we're addressing those issues potentially in advance and looking at those multiple 
uh, interpretations that could be available in certain circumstances. Um, in terms of the omnibus legislation and the um, and compliance generally, there's a huge focus in that in the bill that's currently before Parliament on compliance. It's going to be a real focus for the government. That's not to say that the bill in its current form is going to get through uh, Parliament. Uh, it's coming under a lot of fire from from the other um, uh, representatives from the other. Um, from Labor and, and the Greens and the Independents, no one likes the bill in its current form. But and they're taking issue with lots of things in the bill, changes to uh, enterprise agreements uh, and particularly the boot test. So that test for how enterprise agreements pass that better off overall test as against modern awards. Um, but a huge part of the bill is focused on compliance and really increasing penalties associated with failing to meet minimum award uh, and enterprise agreement requirements and doubling in most respects penalties for um, contraventions of uh, EAs, contraventions of the National Employment Standards, all minimum terms and conditions of employment, and the introduction of a new criminal regime for underpayment or um, failure to pay wages in accordance with awards. So this is legislation that will sit if it gets through, over the top of um, the current Victorian and Queensland um, wage theft legislation to criminalise at a federal level uh, failure to make payments of wages. Now, the failure to make payment of wages has to be uh, systemic uh, failure to make uh, payments, so it can't just be a one-off isolated incident that's going to give rise to significant penalties under this. But they're generally process. always systemic, aren't they? I mean, usually... If we identify them um, on behalf of a number of employees over a period of time, that might satisfy the definition of a systemic underpayment. Um, but it, there is going to have to be as well an element of dishonesty there. But again, how hard is that going to be to make out in circumstances where an employer has failed to do re regular checks mm. in relation to their compliance? Um, that might alone trigger these provisions if, if they if they get up. So I think the the bill and the pressure that government is placing on employers is going to continue to make sure that compliance generally is a real focus for for employers. Um, the Fair Work Ombudsman is continuing its push to investigate a range of industries, not just in relation to wage underpayments. Again, they're focused on the broader issues of compliance as well. They're focused on what do your pay slips say? Do they meet the minimum requirement? Um, uh, what is your record keeping obligations? Have we kept up with them? And again, that comes down to our IFAs. What are we doing in relation to IFAs? And are we meeting, them, meeting the requirements in relation to the use of annualised salary provisions? I think the pressure that the government's placing on the definition of casual employees as well, which is also dealt with in the omnibus legislation, um, and the ability to now understand what is a true casual employee will continue place pressure on employees in relation to compliance. Are we paying our casual employees appropriately? Are these people true casual employees? That also needs to form part of um, a compliance check for employers moving forward. Um, one of the things you said, which I hear um, when, you know, from when I'm talking to boards and others is these grey areas. Um, so, you know, for example, which award does someone actually sit in? You know, receptionists that work in professional services or health services, and all. You know, that's quite common. You see it in, you know, um, retail sectors and all sorts of things where people, particularly in the context in my area in business sales, about looking at their wages compliance. It's like, well, where do these people sit? So how how is that resolved? Um, I mean, can you go and get guidance on those sort of issues, or do you just make a call and hope it's the right one? I mean. Well, um, and particularly where there seems to be an industry position that's taken on something, yeah. for example. And, and look, sometimes there is, and sometimes that industry position can be really helpful. So talking right. to, for employers to talk to their industry peak body can sometimes be helpful in understanding what is the appropriate award. Well, it's more just everyone in an industry does that, you know. Right, okay. Well, I think that's less helpful than yeah. we've just got, um, this is what, you know, Joe down the road who runs the same business does. Mm -hmm. um, the Fair Work Ombudsman obviously has helplines available where they can provide guidance and assistance, but that's not legal advice. Uh, and um, the Fair Work Ombudsman can ultimately make an argument that 
they're not relying upon if they take a contrary view. If their compliance section takes a, a contrary view to their advisory arm, that might be a concern. But they do have mechanisms and, and certainly self-help checks on their website where you can scroll through and identify the industry that you're in, the type of employee you have, and they'll spit out what they think to be the relevant award. Um, if the, the situation is dire and there are conflicting um, uh, opinions in relation to what is the appropriate award that applies in the circumstances, you might be able to seek declaratory relief from the federal court um, as to the appropriate award. But I think the starting point... Is was, anyone doing that, just out of interest? Have you seen anyone? Um, I haven't seen anyone do that mm. yet. Um, but we might. I've, I've seen employers contemplate declaratory relief for interpretation mm. of provisions within mm. awards or enterprise agreements, but mm. not for the one that will ultimately apply. Mm. Certainly I've acted in matters where there has been a significant dispute as to the appropriate award, mm. but it was part of broader litigation, so that would be to determine as part of it um, that it was an underpayment of wages cases that we were dealing with anyway, uh, and a misclassification matter but that would be dealt with as part of that litigation as opposed to needing separate proceedings to, to declare the appropriate award. But it's certainly not unheard of that there can be a range of or at least two choices yeah. of award available in an industry, mm. Parti particularly industries um, uh, or contracting industries that consult to a number of different mm. types of businesses. Things that may be a role for industry think bodies to yeah, potentially it's, it's take on that sort of relief for the industry. Yeah. Um, so then stepping back, um, so we've got all sort of these compliance reviews that are going to be done and, and um, I suppose from a board and senior management point of view, so uh, the board's role to, to monitor and compliance, um, what should, you've said every year, um, even if you've had issues in the past, you still think, you know, what should a board be, what are the questions they should be asking and in terms of what sort of information should they be asking for and how often should they be asking for it in terms of board packs and, and other things? And what should senior management be recommending that they give boards in relation to this area? Okay, I think that's a really good question. Um, uh, I, I might also get DPAC involved in that mm -hmm. answer as well because some of the, the platforms that DPAC's been mm -hmm. talking about might provide will uh, be able to produce some really useful information mm. that might um, assist in those Because there's always that balance between too much information yeah. and too little, right? And and where does that sit and how often and how would you how would you advise yeah. that relation? And I think I think the answer is in two parts. If we've done our comprehensive thorough compliance reviews uh, and we've got a clean bill of health and we've been looking at a twelve month audit type um, program, at that twelve month period um, and we've done our review and it's come back clean again, the type of information I'd be as senior management wanting to give to the board and also as a board member wanting to receive would be about the process really. How have you satisfied yourself that we now have this clean bill of health? Um, have we taken into consideration and how do we demonstrate to the board that we've looked at the current um, award, enterprise agreement, that we've taken into account any changes in legislation along the way? And is there some type of short form um, overview that could be provided to the board in relation to that compliance checks and in relation to the process and the commentary of how you've satisfied yourself on those things? I don't think what's required at board level, and, and Steph, you, you would have an opinion on this as well, um, is a blow by blow breakdown of what people or even groups of people were paid at a particular time and how much they're paid now and why that's okay. It's more the process that you're going through to get to the end conclusion that there is, is nothing to see here. That said, if your compliance audit's throwing up something else and identifying a payslip issue, uh, not that we're not recording um, uh, overtime or penalty rates correctly, I'd be moving up your audit, your um, disclosure program with the board, I'd be having discussions and bringing that to their attention much earlier, particularly at that level of this is where we've identified the concerns. Is it in wages? Is it in a particular group of the organisation? Is it because of um, annualised salaries? That's the type of information the board would need to know and then the board needs to know at the same time what steps are being taken to rectify that and what what resources the organisation might need to enable that rectification process to occur. 
So, Pat, um, I might just get you involved in this as well because when we're talking about that dashboard and the, the program that you're able to create and that I've seen um, so many times before, it has the capacity to drill down into individual levels of detail, either a group of employees or an individual employee and determine per pay period, have they been underpaid or not underpaid. But is there a function or a capacity to have a, a broader overview look and, and with some type of maybe a printout or, or however the board perhaps are provided to boards um, to give that, that high level overview? Yeah. Um, the great thing about data is that you can move up and down data very easily. Um, so the advantage of actually having something like a visual medium such as dashboarding, it gives uh, multiple levels of management access to the same information, but visualized in a way that is uh, going to convey the important messaging to them. So you've got lower level management that might actually be looking at individual um, compliance issues. So the dashboard might pick it up, they'll identify per employee, per pay period, what the particular issues are, providing them the detail that they will need to then undertake that order to try and um, identify what actually caused that issue. You can then roll that up to um, senior executive management who might be looking at uh, the different business units and try and understand where they might actually be having issues uh, in relations to groups of employees. This can then be further rolled up into just an overall organizational um, perspective to show how many issues that they might have had throughout the year, what, what are the type of issues, what is the total quantum of those issues, and those are the type of reports that can be easily taken to the board. Um, and therefore, just having this dashboard that has the advantage of going from top all the way to the bottom, um, you've just got a single tool that is available to, to multiple levels of management and board to just try and show what the, the issues are and the quantum of those issues. A lot of them as well, you can generate reports. So if you are uh, creating a board pack, uh, it's as simple as being able to ge generate that high level um, snapshot of the dashboard to, to summarize a yearly view, add that into a board pack, and, and that can be used as part of the, uh, the discussions uh, down at the board level. Um so, Deepak, following on from that, so one of the big issues from a board perspective, I think, with this whole the wages issue in the initial review is you had that issue of the self, what what I call the self review threat. Or so you you've got an internal team who's been responsible for ensuring compliance, being asked to say, are we complying, right? And and there's there's inherent conflict in that, which means many boards have chosen to go outside the organisation to to avoid that issue. So I suppose with your annual audit, you're going to have that, although on a lesser scale, you are going to have the self-review threat again as well. Now, clearly technology can help avoid that when you automate processes. Um, so I suppose what new technology is out there to, you know, you talked about a lot of programs or things are coming on. Perhaps you can talk about some of them. And then the second part of that question is, I suppose, everything's only as good as the information you put in. So um, whether it's you or Christy talking about how do you, how, from a board's perspective, how do you manage that risk of self-review threat? Someone having to come to you and say, oh, I got that wrong eight months ago, you know, and um, so anyway, over perhaps the technology solutions first, Vika. Yeah, yeah. Um, so from a technology solutions perspective, um, there's probably, I'd have to break this into two, two, two groups. Um, firstly, there are tools in the market when you're looking at award compliance. Because awards are standardised, um, there are providers out there that are essentially building these rule sets. And it might be part of payroll systems or payroll providers that will generally have a separate tool available for award compliance. And what that is doing is it's taking essentially the, the same payroll data, running it through this uh, separate rule set uh, that they have built based on their interpretation of the actual award, and then comparing that to actually what's going through uh, the payroll numbers to identify any discrepancies there. Um, the complexity comes in when you've got um, uh, enterprise agreements because they're essentially bespoke um, uh, instruments there and therefore there isn't many tools on the market that have already um, got the ability to just take an enterprise agreement document and convert that into a set of rules. You really have to look at the document, interpret, you might need different legal interpretations of uh, the, the clauses and then create a rule set. Now, where the tools in the market help with that is there are tools that allow the creation of those rules uh, uh, in a much quicker fashion. 
Um, I'm a bit old school, I like to code, so when I generally do a lot of the work, I am actually coding uh, these rules in a programming language, uh, but not everyone has the ability to do that. So there are tools in the market now that essentially work as uh, drag and drop interfaces. So you can actually drag and drop and say, this is my timesheet data, and then link it to a timesheet system or a different uh, source of data. Then you can uh, drag and say, I want to create a rule where if the start time is uh, before 8 a.m., then those hours need to be applied at a, a different rate or a multiple of the rate that is set in the table. So it's this interface that it just allows users to create these rules without having to know code. Um, and it makes it quite useful for when you've got uh, payroll teams that might want to independently check some of the calculations that are being done in their payroll system to utilize these tools and create these uh, rule sets. Um, the dashboarding uh, is probably the other technology that's very useful. Um, once you've actually got the rules um, that are applying the logic to it, you want to try and visualize the issues themselves. Uh, a lot of times it's quite hard to look at the, the, the actual issues in the content when you've just got tables of numbers. Being able to uh, plot all your employees on a map, you can look at the outliers, you can see if they're particular business units or sets of employees that are um, uh, showing a lot more compliance issues compared to others. Just having that overall view of all your employees just allows you to uh, implement a compliance program to target uh, specific the, the bigger, bigger issues quicker uh, rather than focusing on some of those smaller issues. Um, so yeah, from a technology perspective, there are tools helping speed up the process. So unfortunately, there is nothing that you can just kind of plug in your enterprise agreement to and it, it calculates it for you. But hopefully those tools will actually um, speed up the process and um, allow you to do those ongoing, ongoing compliance tool and compliance checks. Um, the second part of your question as well, Stephanie, um, in relation to the data coming in, this is actually quite critical. Uh, critical, because at the end of the day, the technology is only as good as the data being fed into it. Um, a lot of the issues we sometimes see at organizations is uh, business units might interpret certain policies differently. So when it comes down to things like employees putting in timesheets, you might actually have different business units that provide direction to their employees to state that, or even if you're working, say, an extra hour, uh, overtime hour, just put in your start and end date. And at the end of the day, if you're taking that data and feeding it into any tool set, because it's got garbage data, it's essentially going to say, yes, there's no issue here. Um, so as part of the technology, there really needs to be also process uh, reviews. There needs to be that internal audit checks, that compliance checks to make sure that business units are actually complying um, to the policies and that they understand uh, the implications of, of that as well. So yes, there is technology that can help, but as critical, there needs to be those, um, those uh, process audits uh, in place as well to, to help the technology achieve the best it can. And can I just jump in on, on that particular point? This is where Deepak and I do a lot of work mm -hmm. together. So if we've got, um, if, if one of our clients wants to run one of these compliance audits or reviews and set up the dashboard, uh, and they have an enterprise agreement or multiple enterprise agreements in place. I write the rules for that. I I say, and, and not the technology rules, I write the interpretation of the um, the enterprise agreement provisions and how I believe, based on the law, they should be interpreted. Um, and then I go through a consultation process with the client. So how do you interpret it? Why do you interpret it this way? And we test that to make sure that we've got the right, not necessarily what they currently do, but what ultimately we see as the correct interpretation and the one most likely to be upheld if challenged by a court. Then I give that all to Deepak, who is able to write those technical rules around it to set up the dashboard. And sometimes, and this has occurred, where we've had to write two rules for a particular provision because there are two differing interpretations, both of which are valid, and we want to see in a dashboard sense how that is going to play out from a financial point of view. And we're able to do that. So which is more favourable and which is less yeah, favourable. Yeah. Um, because if you want to be prudent, you just apply the more favourable. Exactly, yeah, exactly. But are yeah. we going to be line ball and yeah. do we need yeah. to make an argument in relation yeah. to how we've interpreted? So presumably a board can make their own, depending on their risk profile, their yeah. risk profile they can make their decisions which one they want to use. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, okay. Um, I suppose just one final question on that before we move to a couple of questions from the floor actually. Um, you said there are products out there that apply the upper rule set, right, or there are products where you can put in what you think the award says and they manipulate it. How do you know they've got it right? 
CPAC, what if their rules fits wrong? So, you know, what if yeah. the per who is the Christie person that's writing that rule set? And what if it's wrong, yeah. the product you're using? I mean, presumably if it's wrong, it's wrong, right? Yeah. yeah. So problem. what do you have to do due yeah. diligence on these products or? Yeah, we, we'd always recommend you have somebody independent look at it. Um, it just gives you that comfort that you have had another set of eyes that have either come through from a legal interpretation or from a technical perspective as well, just making sure how they've done their calculation uh, is correct. Um, at the end of the day, the more eyes that you have over these calculations and the methodologies that you're actually using, the more comfort that you're going to get that those rules are actually correctly interpreted and also correctly applied um, those rules as well from a technology perspective. Um, so I'm going to move on to a couple of questions that have come from the, the participants, the attendees. Um, so the first one's around annualised salaries, so the sort of dreaded annualised salaries, how they more favourable. So the question is, because of these issues that have been coming up now, particularly in that area, and every time we do a due diligence, I hear you talk about annual annualised salaries as well. She loves um, it. Are you, the question is, are you seeing some employers actually stop, you know, relying less on that award provision because of the risks associated with it, presumably, um, and the administrative hurdles now that are going to be associated with that, so the cost of the business of working out if you comply and moving back to, they've said, contractual set-off provisions and those sorts of things. So. Yeah. Yes, definitely, we are seeing that. The, the introduction of annualised salary provisions in modern awards has been rather tortured. Um, and the rules and regulations put around annualised salaries, the need to record start and finish times for employees that we would never think that to record their start and finish times, and as well the start and finish times of, of unpaid breaks, so we can properly check the hours that are being worked, can be a real um, uh, administrative hurdle. Uh, for many businesses, uh, and including the 12-month check, though I think that should be done in any event. So we are seeing businesses want to move away from that and simply rely upon um, yep, set-off provisions or what we call um, award offset or above award payment clauses in contracts. That, that's not a risk-free option either, unfortunately. Those clauses need to be drafted in a very particular type of way uh, to manage the risks arising from uh, award non-compliance. And also the risks that we're now seeing come out of some of the uh, more recent decisions, uh, the, the casual decisions around from Workpack and Rosado is the most recent one. Now I know that was about um, casual employees, but there was a significant consideration of the ability to offset and rely upon set off clauses in contracts um, to set off the casual loading that this individual received against what he, what the court was saying he was now entitled to, being his uh, leave entitlement as a permanent employee. And the court said that the contract hadn't been drafted in a particular way and didn't allow that type of set-off. So I think the courts are really going to take a fine tooth comb to any type of set-off or um, above award payment clause in contracts. Uh, I'm also concerned that, it, particularly in relation to the awards where we have these dedicated annualised salary provisions, and the award applies, so there is limited basis to move away from those provisions. A failure to comply with the terms of that award is a failure to comply with the award. And we say we might be doing it under another mechanism. Um, I think it remains open for the court to say there is only one mechanism to use. If you want to use an annualised salary arrangement, this is the mechanism set out in the award. That's what you need to comply with, including all the hurdles that go with it. I flag that as a risk. There's been no decision of that nature that we've seen from the courts, though we've only had these uh, annualised salary provisions since uh, about March. So no one's argued it. No one's argued that yeah, point, so but I do know. flag it as a risk. But certainly I am seeing from a commercial and a practical perspective, clients and employers generally looking for that simplified approach, relying upon their contract award offset provisions and not entering into a formal annualised salary um, uh, provision in accordance with the award. Um, so another question um, from attendees um, on the Omnibus Bill, so it's probably you again, Christy. Um, so they've said, um, is there anything in particular in these proposed changes impacting on sort of employment agreements awards that they should be particularly aware of? I'm assuming there's a lot of stuff, yeah. but 
um, perhaps there's some highlights, and um, they want your view of the likelihood of the bill being passed. We might, we might deal with that second part first. I think the likelihood of the bill being passed in its current form are slim to none. So it's received just uh, no support from Crossbench or the opposition at all. The ALP caucus has resolved in its entirety uh, to oppose the bill. Um, so I, I simply don't see how it can get through the House in its current form. This is a move away from what we've seen as a really cooperative approach um, to legislation, emergency legislation during COVID. But what, um, what the federal opposition are saying, what all of the state Labor governments are saying is that uh, this legislation in its current form is not necessary from an emergency perspective to safeguard wages, to safeguard entitlements, and it will have the opposite effect. Um, so they're, they're moving away from their approach of supporting this type of legislation. Um, a report is due from the Senate inquiry um, on the 12th of March. So I think that will be a, a good time frame for us to revisit whether the Senate inquiry are making any um, proposed recommendations that would save the bill, that we could make it in a different form, uh, that it might get through, or alternatively whether it's, we're just going to have to go back to the drawing board. And in terms of the first part of the question, are there any proposed changes in the legislation to awards? Yes, there's a whole, there's a whole move there to simplify um, award processes, particularly around part-time employees and hours of work, as opposed to um, setting in stone hours of work for part-time employees, there's a, there's a bid to make that more flexible. So any hours worked by the part-time employee may be considered ordinary hours of work, so you would have to pay overtime on those types of hours. Um, there's some... Uh, uh, other changes around flexible work directions as well, though they have sunset provisions in them after a period of two years, they're supposed to come out because presumably by that time the um, the thinking is then that the, the pandemic or the concerns and the impact on business will have passed significantly and they won't be necessary. There are changes proposed to enterprise agreements in the making of enterprise agreements, so the pre-approval process and the approval process. What they're looking to do is place more pressure on the Commission as well to uh, approve enterprise agreements in a more timely fashion. They're looking to change the boot, though, though some of those changes as well are subject to sunset uh, provisions as well, so they won't remain uh, in around forever. Um, and changes to timeframes for when employers can apply to terminate an enterprise agreement after uh, it's normal expiry date, so they, they want to push it out. You can't apply to terminate for a period of three months after a normal expiry date of an enterprise agreement. I don't think that's particularly significant, but they think the effect of this is going to be that it will prevent employers using it as a tool in bargaining, in bargaining for the new agreement. So a threat, really, that we're going to terminate that one and you're going to go back to the award minimum. So that's, that's a really high level overview of some of the changes to the omnibus, of some of the changes that will be brought in by the omnibus bill. Um, I think some of them could be could be good, could be useful, uh, not getting a lot of support, as I say, from state and federal labour. Um, Deepak, so a question for you from the floor. Um, you talked about some of these analytical tools. Are you able to... Um, name some of them or give some examples of some of those tools that are out there? Yeah, um, probably a, a common one I see these days. It's a tool called AlterX. Um, what it is is essentially a, a drag and drop interface. So it has the ability for somebody to come in, they can just drag and say data source and then they can connect it to a, a lot of common systems. So uh, if you use an Oracle system, it's got the ability there just to connect into your Oracle payroll system and pull out the, the data. Um, it also has the ability to link into visualization software. Um, the more common ones are things like Tableau or Power BI or QuickSense. Um, they're probably the three most common ones. Um, so it gives you the ability using this tool AlterX to connect to your payroll databases, pull out the data that you require, create the rules within its interface, uh, and then connect it into a, a data visualization medium such as Tableau and Power BI to then be able to generate those reports. That's probably the most common uh, interface I see. There are other products I know uh, similar to 
um, to AlterX. Uh, Tableau has a solution called Tableau Prep. Uh, there's another solution called LavaStorm. Um, so there's a couple of tools in, in the, the industry, but they're probably the most common ones that I uh, hear and see these days. Okay, thanks, Deepak. Um, so I suppose moving on to um, perhaps the dispute landscape now, where it has been pretty active. Um, and um, I understand um, they're still continuing to take, the Fair Work Ombudsman is still continuing to take a pretty active role in the compliance landscape. Yeah. Um, what other things are you seeing out there? What are people, you know, how, how are this, is there any different way people are approaching this or, or taking disputes or managing disputes? Yeah, so, and you're right, Fair Work Ombudsman is still really active, particularly in the um, enforceable undertaking space, just trying to make it agreements with employers who have an identified underpayment in advance of prosecution as an alternative to prosecution. You don't think that's going to be, you know, we had the Royal Commission, the whole banks and APRA with the enforceable undertakings and if not, why not litigate? That's yeah. not going to change their position on 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 that. It seems sort of to me to be history of repeating itself as a yeah. regulator. Look, I don't think so and mainly because um, what we're seeing in the omnibus Legislation, even though that legislation might not get up, what it's saying is the government is really focused on on compliance and the increase in penalties, um, and so it's going to give greater teeth to the regulator. Uh, whether the regulator then says that well, we're going to use those teeth, um, I haven't ever seen them take that that, that particular step. I'm not saying they won't, uh, but you know, as as of January this this year, they are still entering into a enforceable undertaking. Um, and for, for amounts, and when we're talking about underpayments, those amounts vary from you know, the $200,000, um, which seems to pale into insignificance in terms of what we've seen in terms of underpayments to, to upwards of 11 or you know, more million. Uh, so look, look, I don't know, I think it's a really good question, Steph, and I think we should put a pin in that one and maybe come back to it uh, at a future point to see if that's going to change the position. Um, but I certainly don't think that rectification of underpayments is the sole purview of the Fair Work Ombudsman or even unions who were, are known to prosecute underpayment cases on behalf of individual employees or a number of employees of an organisation. What we are seeing is um, a real move by litigation funders uh, as part of class actions to raise underpayments, mm. um, which I think is... Uh, concerning for our employers uh, and what the courts are seeing uh, and saying in relation to the appearance of litigation funders is that we don't want to prejudice employees being able to bring this case or the group members being able to bring this case. So what we're seeing is a um, maybe a reluctance on behalf of courts to enforce interlocutory orders or security for cost applications as against litigation funders because they see that as directly putting a penalty on the group members who are the employees who have been potentially underpaid and are looking to prosecute the, their particular case. So just on that, for those that, that um, I think what Chris is saying is if, if you get a, a funder that effectively agrees to fund the litigation on behalf of the employees, it's whether the employer can ask for um, some security for their costs if that, that action is unsuccessful, which often you would get from, from, from them, but the courts have been willing to say they won't seek security of costs orders if there's evidence that shows that that means the litigation funder won't proceed, yeah. which is, of course, what they're all saying. Yeah. Right now that they've got a court that said that's a reason, yeah. so they're able to pursue these without any security or putting up any money to cover costs yeah. if they're unsuccessful, right? Yeah, and the other issue that we're seeing is um, from these class action proceedings, um, the proposed settlement, if the settlement is reached, needs to go back before the court to be approved mm -hmm. by, by the federal court. Um, and we've seen a recent example in the case of Bywater where the court said, well, I'm not satisfied with the amount that the employer is agreeing to pay in these circumstances because I don't think that gives a big enough um, uh, upside to the individual group members. It's not going to compensate them appropriately for what is what loss they say that they've suffered in these circumstances. And keep in mind that part of that will be going directly to the litigation funder yeah. uh, and they will not be seeing all of that settlement sum in any event. So we've got the court um, 
directly putting pressure on the employers by refusing to grant these interlocutory applications and the, the security for costs orders, and at the same time um, saying that they won't accept it, the amounts that have agreed to being paid by the employers in circumstances where they don't think it is sufficient compensation. So you send the parties away again to renegotiate for an increased sum, putting the litigation funder in a real position of power yeah. I think, in those negotiations. So it could be a double-edged sword there for employers. Um, but again, I think it comes back to compliance. Like we've got all these avenues where um, employers can be prosecuted or there's the potential of um, civil penalties or criminal sanctions uh, for non-compliance. We've got to then go back to the drawing board, don't we, and look at our compliance regime and really think about is it sufficient, is it robust enough, have we identified any problems and how often are we doing those checks? I mean, just to give some people an indication of these litigation funders and how attractive this might be to them to pursue, the case that Christy was talking about, the litigation funder, um, they were going to get 50% of the entitlement to the group of employees. So, you know, depending on what that payout was, if it's 10 million, they get five of that. Yeah. So, you know, it's there is a real incentive for litigation funders there if they can mine and find the cases. So I think we're going, I think we're going to see more of that. Yeah. Um, and then it becomes a real question as to these are if, if they're alleging that these are statutory payments that were supposed to be made to employees, and the litigation fund is taking half of it. How is that obligation to make the statutory payment being satisfied? Mm. I, I think there's a real there's a real um, touch point there. That is something that the courts, when they're considering these financial settlements. Isn't turning their minds, or hasn't had to yet turn their mind to. Okay, so I think we expect this area to remain fertile for those wishing actions for a period of time yet. Um, So I'm mindful we're um, close to time. Um, So I'd like to thank the panelists and the attendees um, for for joining us today. I suppose just in the last few minutes we've got. just thought um, it might be useful um, if any of you have, um, you know, one thing that you think you'd be top of mind in terms of this sort of ongoing compliance issue for the benefit of the attendees here today. Yes, got it. Well, I'll, I'll kick off. So as the employment lawyer, I'd be keeping a, an eye on that omnibus legislation. That is going to significantly increase penalties if it gets up. And, but as I say, I don't think it's getting up in its current form. But some of those compliance sanctions will probably go through in another form. So that's something definitely to keep our eye on. Deepak, I don't know if you've got anything you want to add. Oh, Deepak, yeah. you're on mute. All right, we couldn't get through the webinar without having without being able to say that. Did you back something all kinds of technical issues? Maybe we go to David. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, in terms of um, superannuation and compliance audits, it's always better to find out sooner rather than later that there is a problem. Um, employers should really think about um, super guarantee from an employment perspective and also from an ATO facing perspective, so it's important to um, uh, do those um, audits uh, 12 months and whenever there's any material change, and that means check early and check often and then check again. Thanks, David. Uh, Deepak, let's see if we can hear you this time, and you're obviously in the lights now. No. No, so I think we might have a technical issue with you, Deepak, of some nature, so sorry about that, but we might, we might round it up at this point. So once again, thank you for your attendance and I hope you found some of those insights useful. And of course, you know, if you do have any follow on questions, feel free to, to shoot them through um, and we will make the video available as well. Thank you.